Only next morning, people asked him, Swamiji, where had you gone? He said, I had heard of a shrine nearby called Kshira Bhavani. It contains an image of Durga which had been desecrated by Mahmud of Ghazni long ago. I went to see that. This is a close-up image. The nose had been cut off, one of the hands had been cut off. I stood before the image and told mother in my heart, Oh mother, had I been alive at that time, I would have protected you with my own life. Then I heard the inner voice, the mother telling me, My dear child, who is to protect whom? Are you to protect me or am I to protect you? If I want, I can erect such temples, hundreds of them in no time. Don't ever have that arrogance. Swamiji says, I felt humbled. We start with the prayer. Om Namah Shri Ati Rajaya Om Namah Shri Ati Rajaya Viveka Nanda Suraye Viveka Nanda Suraye Satchit Sukha Swarupaya Satchit Sukha Swarupaya Swamine Tapaharine Swamine Tapaharine Around the month of June 1898, a party of about eight people left Kolkata towards Kashmir. Swamiji was there, the three Westerners, a couple of sannyasis, and a couple of brahmacharis. They went in a leisurely manner up to Kashmir because there were lots of places on the way the Westerners wanted to see. It was a sightseeing program and pilgrimage for them. Until at last they reached Srinagar, the capital of Kashmir. They decided not to stay in a hotel, but to stay on the dull lake in water known as shikaras or houseboats. Has anyone been to Kashmir? seen this place absolutely beautiful Firdausi a Persian poet on seeing Kashmir had said in Persian if there is paradise on earth it is this it is this it is this that was the impression which the Muslims got when they came to India so this is one of the boats they hired about half a dozen boats one boat was reserved for Swamiji, one for Sarah Bull, one for Josephine and Nivedita, and the other two or three for the sannyasis and brahmacharis. They used to go around visiting places either on this lake or on land. One day Swamiji announced that he is going to Amarnath, the cave of Amarnath. He went that morning, came back after two days and said, passengers or other pilgrims cannot go there because there is a landslide and the path has been blocked. What were they doing the whole day? This was the time for Swamiji to educate <coughs> Sister Nivedita in Indian culture. Nivedita was a good student but like Swamiji himself used to ask lots of questions and Swamiji encouraged her. He said unless you ask questions and get them clarified you will not understand anything. Swamiji himself used to question Sri Ramakrishna quite a lot. One day Swamiji announced the road to Amarnath has been cleared. I am leaving tomorrow morning. And he looked at Nivedita and asked her, Margot, 
would you like to come along? Margot was taken by surprise. Because no western woman had set foot inside the cave of Amarnath. She hesitated. Sarah Bull told her, if Swamiji is calling you, don't say no. He will take care of you. So next morning, bidding goodbye to the rest in the camp in Srinagar, the two of them set out. They had hired a couple of coolies who were carrying the tents and other things for them. So they travelled all the way by foot. Ultimately, they came to the town of Pahalgaon. Pahalgaon is an absolutely beautiful town nestling in the, on the footsteps of the Himalayas. There is a village on one side. On the other side, there are the Himalayas. In between, there is a field of grass full of small flowers and in the midst a small stream, Lidhar. The water of Lidhar is straight from the mountains so it is absolutely pure but if you want to drink it you have to have a cup or a vessel. You can't put your finger inside. If you put your finger inside and take a little bit of water the fingers get frozen. It is so cold because it is coming straight from the snow. Beautiful scenic surrounding. There were lots of tents there belonging to pilgrims of various types. Swamiji wanted to pitch their tents right in their midst. An aged sannyasi took objection. He told Swamiji Maharaj, you have brought a western woman, Mlekcha woman, so you cannot stay with us. Swamiji's face became grim. Just then a younger sannyasi came, whispered in his ear, Maharaj, you have the power, don't use it, it is not worth it. So Swamiji kept quiet. The two of them went to the outskirts and pitched their tents. Swamiji called Nivedita and told her, Margot, go into the town, purchase about half a dozen wicker baskets, cane baskets. Gather as many of these small flowers as you can. So in half an hour, she came with the baskets full of the flowers. Swamiji told her, now sit down and make as many bouquets as you can. So in another one hour, she made a large number of bouquets. Swamiji told her, come with me. So they went to the first tent they saw, which coincidentally enough belonged to that old sannyasi who had objected. Nivedita went inside, gave that old sannyasi a bouquet, touched his feet, asked for his permission to come to Amarnath. The same old man had earlier said about Nivedita, Mlecha. What is Mlecha? Foreigner, untouchable. Now suddenly he said, Chalo beta hamare saath. She became the daughter. How come? Later the sannyasi said, she knows our customs and manners. She is not like other westerners who don't know our manners. She knows she is one of our people. And when he came to know that she is a brahmacharini, he was all the more impressed. In no time the entire camp welcomed her as a daughter. So Swamiji solved this problem very diplomatically without confrontation. Next morning, around 3 o'clock, the whole camp got up. All the tents were removed. The people with the tents were asked to stay back and the whole group started moving towards Amarnath. This is a photo taken in Kashmir and this is the western group with Swamiji. The standing person with the umbrella is Josephine the one sitting is Sarah Bull and to the extreme right is Nivedita. And this is the path to Amarnath. Today of course you can go there by helicopter, you can go by car, but there are still a few pious pilgrims who want to trek it all the way by foot. And this is the path. 
ultimately they came to Amarnath. Anybody here who has been to Amarnath? No. Before you reach the shrine, this is the shrine. Ice Lingam. Before you reach that place, there are four or five small streams. And pious pilgrims take a dip in all of them. Swamiji told Nivedita, I want to take a dip. She protested. She said, your health is not all right. That is why we brought you here. Don't do that. But Swamiji was stubborn. So he plunged into the first stream, came up with wet clothes. He had one change of dress. He changed his dress and continued on to the next stream. When he took a dip in the second stream, there were no dry clothes left. So what did he do? He looked around. There were lots of ashes lying around. Ashes from the fires which had been lit by pilgrims in the night, the previous pilgrims in the night, to protect themselves from cold and to protect themselves from wild animals. He smeared the ash over his body. You know, ash is a, an excellent insulator, a very poor conductor. It keeps you warm. So third stream, he had a dip, some more ashes. Fourth stream, a drip, some more ashes. Fifth stream, another dip, some more ashes. Nivedita says in her reminiscences, I started wondering if Shiva he is going to the cave to see Shiva. <laughs> Swamiji looked like Shiva with all the you know, vibhuti on his body. They entered the cave. Swamiji and Nivedita, there were many other pilgrims. The two of them stood before Aisling them. Nivedita was watching Swamiji. His face was glowing. He appeared to be in ecstasy. Five minutes and then he started shivering. The reaction had set in. He had started feeling the cold. Nivedita saw that, quickly hustled him out, brought him outside, managed to purchase a couple of blankets from the local market, wrapped him in the blankets, woolen blankets, brought him as fast as possible to Pahalgaon. Swamiji was taken to a Vaidya Kaviraj, Ayurveda doctor, who examined him and told him, Maharaj, it's a miracle you are alive. You should be dead by now. Your heart is permanently swollen. It could have burst any time. And your right eye is damaged beyond control. From that day till his last day, he could not see properly with the right eye. And his heart was swollen to such an extent, he could not withstand strain. He laughed, Swamiji. He told the doctor, Doctor, when I was standing before Shiva, I asked him, Have I completed my responsibilities? Can I come and join you now? Shiva said, no, not yet, not yet. When it is over, you will be told. Then you can come and join me. Nivedita says, I don't know whether the doctor understood what Swamiji was saying. I certainly understood prophecy of Sri Ramakrishna. When Narayan comes to know who he is, he will leave this body, fly away like a free bird. From there, they came to the base camp in Srinagar. One day, Swamiji disappeared in the morning. Nobody knew where he had gone. He had not told anybody. He returned three days later. Josephine saw him coming from a distance, came and told the other people in the camp, Swamiji is coming back. His face is glowing. Swamiji came closer. He was muttering something. And they heard him mutter, Ma, Ma, it lasted the whole day. He could not say anything else except Ma, Mother, Mother. Only next morning people asked him, Swamiji, where had you gone? He said, I had heard of a shrine nearby called Kshira Bhavani. It contains an image of Durga which had been desecrated by Mahmud of Ghazni. 
long ago. I went to see that. This is a close-up image. The nose had been cut off. One of the hands had been cut off. I stood before the image and told mother in my heart, Oh mother, had I been alive at that time, I would have protected you with my own life. Then I heard the inner voice, the mother telling me, My dear child, who is to protect whom? Are you to protect me or am I to protect you? If I want, I can erect such temples, hundreds of them in no time. Don't ever have that arrogance. Swamiji says, I felt humbled. Then his mind went back to Dakineshwa. Ma, Ami Bhakti Dao, Vivek Dao, Bhairag Dao. He remembered that incident with Kali. And so he became humble and he went on reciting the name of Ma Ma. Sarah Bull was the only person who understood that Swamiji has started packing up. He will not be with us for too much of time. Mind you, this was <coughs> the middle of 1898. He had four more years to go. The Western disciples then said, they want to go to Rajasthan, meet the Raja of Khetri and see the old principalities of Rajasthan. Swamiji sent one of his Guru Bhais and one Brahmachari with them to accompany them to Khetri. And he told Nivedita, Margot, we have work to do in Kolkata. She had to start her school. So the two of them by October returned to Kolkata. Now Nivedita plunged into her work of school. She faced all kinds of problems. Number one, from the orthodox families. How can a Mlecha woman come to India and try to teach our children? That too, how can widows go out of the house to a school? I told you already, society was so strict, widows could not step out of the threshold. The Britishers somehow felt that Nivedita being an Irish lady actually is a spy for the I for Ireland. The revolution had already started in Ireland. The IRA had not yet come. Irish Republican Army had not yet come, but the Irish people were already demanding independence. They kept an eye on Nivedita. At every step, she found obstacles. Swamiji told her, Margot, you can't depend upon these people for financial assistance. Why don't you go back to England in England, the English people are more understanding of India than the Englishmen who have come to India. Why? In England, they treated you on par. But in India, they were the masters and we were the slaves. So the attitude is different. So she said, Swamiji, I don't mind going back, but you have to come with me. Josephine and Sarah Bull have told me that if I return to the West, I have to bring you along with me. Swamiji said, no, I have a lot of work to do. Oh, it doesn't matter. The others can do the job, but you better come. What was the work Swamiji had to do? By the end of 1898 and the beginning of 1899, the Belur Mutt land had been purchased. I told you already that the Westerners were living there in that house for one or two months. Now the development of the land had to be done. Swamiji had to be there to do a lot of planning. But all his Guru Bhais insisted that Swamiji should go back to the West, to America, for recouping his health. <coughs> Until finally, Swamiji's health broke down and he decided it will be wiser on his part to go back to the West for a period of rest. This is the poem he composed when he had been to Kshir Bhavani. <coughs> Incidentally, Kshir Bhavani has now been renovated and there is a branch of the Ramakrishna order in Kshir Bhavani. 
it has now become a big town, a pilgrimage center. This is known as Kali the Mother, this poem, Swami is handwriting. Based on this, Nivedita later gave a series of lectures in Kolkata in Star Theatre, which has come down to us in the form of a book, Kali the Mother. You know, it's rather amazing how well she understood the concept of Kali. Finally, in the beginning of June 1899, Swamiji agreed to go back to the West. This is a photo taken just before he left on the 19th of June and you can see him sitting in the middle. I hope you can see how thin he has become. The face is drawn, looks like a sickly person. This picture is even more clear. There is one person standing behind him, to our right, his left, Swami Turiyananda. And the one sitting to the right extreme is Brahmananda. Brahmananda, the president of the Ramakrishna order. Brahmananda told Swamiji, Naren, don't go back alone. Take Turiyananda with you, because he will help you in your work. Turiyananda agreed. Nivedita was there. So the three of them, towards the end of June 1899, left Kolkata for a return to the West. They had been well stocked with all provisions. There was only one problem at that time. Kolkata had gone through a bout of cholera. Because it had gone through a bout of cholera, Nivedita had done a lot of work for the cholera victims. The resident or the Viceroy became softer and said, we will now assist you in starting the school. But she said, I don't want your assistance. I'll go to England, earn my own money. So the three of them left Kolkata. The first halt of the ship in the Bay of Bengal was Madras. The ship was not allowed to enter the Madras harbor. It had been quarantined. What is the reason? Cholera. Only British officers were allowed to disembark or embark. Swamiji or Nivedita makes a remark as if the cholera germs respected the white skin. <laughs> Natives, as they were called, were not allowed. When they were standing on the deck looking at the city of Madras, Nivedita saw a strange sight. Half a dozen small boats came from the harbour to their ship, went round in the clockwise direction, Pradakshana Namaskara, three times. And then from there, Ramakrishnananda got a lot of instructions from Swami Vivekananda about the functioning of the Madras centre. Not only that, Nivedita saw one boat come with something which looked like severe human heads. She asked Swamiji, Swamiji, what is all that? They look like severe human heads. He laughed and said, oh, that is tender coconut. Yalaneer. She is so thoughtful of Alasinga Perumal. Anyway, Swamiji is going to travel in that boat, which is going to be quarantined everywhere. They are not likely to get good water so why not they drink Yalavir? Nature's air-conditioned or cooled water, perfectly hygienic with all vitamins and minerals. You can't expect anything better than that. But our people prefer bottled juice. Hmm? Even Keralites have stopped drinking Yalavir because they grow Yalavir in enormous quantities. But even today in Prashanti Kutira, if somebody is sick, the first thing the servant maids recommend is drink coconut water, you will be all right. <laughs> Many times it really works out that way. So this was the wonderful gesture of Alasinga Perumal. Alasinga Perumal did one more thing. He purchased a ticket for traveling by that ship from Madras to Colombo. He could spend some time with Swamiji. He could get a lot of instructions about the Madras activity. 
he got off in Colombo. And Swamiji, Turiyananda and Nivedita continued the journey. From Colombo, they came to Aden. Aden was still a part of Aden was still a part of India, Indian Empire. So they were still on Indian soil. From there, they went west and entered into the Suez Canal. And after crossing the Suez Canal in the north, they turned left, came to Marseille. And in Marseille, the passengers are told, the ship is going to Southampton. Those who are going to Europe have to get down in Marseille. But Swamiji and the other two people were going to London anyway, England. They remained on board. Then they rounded the Cape of Gibraltar and turned towards the north east direction, ultimately landed in Southampton. They got down from the boat, took a train to come to London. Nivedita told Swamiji, I have to start my work here, so I am going to stay with my mother, take the help of my younger brother, and I will start raising the money. And these two people met Edward Sturdy, and Swamiji found that the work in London had literally collapsed because there was nobody to look after the work. However, he promised them that he is going to arrange for somebody to come to London. And now, after two weeks, they caught a ship going to New York. Ultimately, after a very stormy voyage, the two of them reached New York. The Vedanta Society had been well established. Abhedananda was in charge. But Abhedananda had gone at that particular time to Boston to meet Sarah Bull. See, after seeing Rajasthan, the Americans had already returned to United States. The moment he heard that Swamiji and Turiyananda have come, he rushed back to New York and gave them some information. We have to proceed immediately to the north, the upstate New York, to the estate of the Leggett family, Ridgely Mena. So after a few days, the three of them traveled by train to Ridgely Manor. Ridgely Manor near Stone Ridge village. And this is where Swamiji spent a couple of months. But not in this house. This was the main house. It was a huge estate and there were quite a good number of houses there. This was called the little cottage. You can imagine if this is the little cottage, what a big cottage would look like. <laughs> and this is where the three sannyasis were accommodated. Abhedananda had joined them, Turiyananda, Vivekananda. Sarah Bull came from Boston to visit them and there is a picture taken there. Sarah Bull wanted instructions about the activities in the United States. An incident has been reported in some books on Swami Vivekananda. Some books say it happened in Ridgely Manor. Some other books say it happened in Pasadena. Makes no difference for the beauty of that incident. So I am going to narrate it here itself. Very likely it happened only in Ridgely Manor. One afternoon, Josephine was living there. You remember, Josephine was Francis Leggett's sister-in-law. She arranged a parlor talk by Swamiji in the main house for four o'clock. That day at half past three, she came to the little cottage, asked the other sannyasis, is Swamiji here? They said, no, he already left about three o'clock. We don't know where he has gone. He has not come there to the main house. They say, I'm sorry, we don't know. I told you already, it was a huge estate. Now she started searching for Swamiji. She couldn't locate Swamiji anywhere until she heard the voices of children from a distance singing a nursery rhyme. And among the childish voices, she heard the male baritone 
voice of a grown up man she went there and what does she see all the children are linking hands with swami ji going round and round in a circle singing that very popular ditty ringa ringa roses pocket full of posies hasha busha all fall down they would all fall down laugh clap get up swami ji would do the same and link hands and again go round and round and round josephine came there looked sternly at swami ji and told him swami ji politely he said yes yum yum you have to give a talk at 4 o'clock it is already 4 o'clock have you forgotten oh i completely forgot you know it is so wonderful playing with the children cancel the lecture cancel the lecture she said how can i cancel the lecture the audience is already there in the parlor they are waiting for you you can't cancel the lecture then swami ji looks at the children and says see children this is the problem of being an adult you have to dance to their tunes i'll do one thing i'll go and tell them something in 10 minutes come back we will continue to play josephine says i thought today's lecture is going to be a disaster so swami ji started walking with josephine towards the main building looking back and waving to the children and the children went on waving to him yay they went on shouting until they came to the parlor the door step one last look at the children and a wave swami ji entered the parlor josephine says his face suddenly changed it became very serious with measured steps he entered sat on the chair allotted to him apologized to the crowd spoke for about an hour and a half on advaita philosophy and according to josephine one of the finest talks of swami ji she has heard in the united states josephine says what a quick change artist with children he can be like a child with adults he can be an adult one day josephine got a letter from los angeles now we are shifting our attention to california los angeles from a lady called sk blodget mrs sk blodget sara k blodget my dear josephine i have a young man staying with me for the last few years as a boarder his name is taylor mcleod he claims to be your younger brother unfortunately he is on his death bed before dying he wants to see you would it be possible for you to come over to los angeles to my house to see him josephine showed the letter to swami ji and asked him swami ji would you like to come along to los angeles swami ji said no not now you have to look after your brother when things have settled down send word to me i'll come and join you before i come rustle up a few lectures so that i can come and give a few talks josephine went to me she came to los angeles to the two of you must have seen los angeles you are very close to los angeles anyway now let me see if you can recognize los angeles this is a group photograph there <laughs> does it look like los angeles you know we had one student from la a young man after the class he came and told me swami ji i will i would not be surprised if this was a movie set which got absorbed into the city you know los angeles is a huge megalopolis it is actually a conglomeration of several big cities and does this not look like a typical movie set of the wild west movies any moment you expect cowboys to come out of these houses <laughs> with a shooter <laughs> right so this is the place where josephine came and she went to the house of sarah blodget sarah blodget took her upstairs to the room where her brother was lying on the bed and on the wall at the head of the bed josephine saw this picture 
she asked Sarah Broadjet, Madam, do you know who it is? Of course I know who it is. It is the great Swami Vivekananda of India. Where did you get this poster? In Chicago. Josephine's ears pricked up. What? You attended the parliament in Chicago? Yes, my dear Josephine. I attended all the days of the parliament. And you know, on the very first day, when this young man came to the rostrum, crossed his arms over his chest, and said those five simple words, the entire audience stood up and applauded. They knew not what. They did not know why they were applauding. They applauded. When the noise settled down, he spoke briefly for about two to two and a half minutes, and then there was a pandemonium. Whistling, shouting, applauding, and I saw the shameless hussies in the audience hitch up their skirts up to their knees, climb up on the benches, come running towards the rostrum, and some of them started kissing the hem of Swamiji's dress. And I heard them muttering, Jesus, Jesus. Then I told myself, young man, if you can withstand this onslaught of these beautiful women of America, you must be God himself. And you know, Josephine, he was God. I kept track of his movements. He never came to the West. One day I heard that he has gone back to India. The biggest regret of my life is I may not be able to see him again. Josephine said, you want to see him again? He is on the East Coast with my sister and brother-in-law. He is waiting for my call. But this is not the proper time. I have to look after my brother. Taylor was the black sheep of the family. He had abandoned family when he was young and he was terribly scared of Betty Leggett. But he was very fond of Josephine. That is why in the last moments of his life he wanted to see Josephine, not Betty. And Josephine consoled him, stayed with him for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, Taylor MacLeod breathed his last peacefully and calmly. With Josephine by his side, he somehow felt I have been accepted back into the family. A few days later, Josephine sent a letter to Swamiji to Ridgely Manor. Would it be possible for you to come over here? Swamiji, meanwhile, had already made some excursions into Chicago. He wanted to see the Hale family. Then he had come to New York to check on how the work was going on in the New York Center under Abhedananda. He had also gone to Boston. When they returned to Ridgely Manor, the letter was waiting for him. So, with Turiyananda, he decided to go to the West. But Turiyananda said, you go first, I'll come and join you. When there is work for me, you send word to me. Abhedananda said, let Turiyananda be here for some time to help me out. When you need him, you let me know. I will send him straight to, you know, the California, wherever you are. So Swamiji came alone to Los Angeles. Josephine received him in the station and they did not go to Sarah Blodgett's house immediately. He had a commitment to stay with another lady for about a week or so. A lady he had earlier met in the house of Catherine Abbott Sanborn. He stayed with her for about a week and afterwards shifted to the house of Sarah Blodgett. Sarah Blodgett was in seventh heaven now. Her hero had come home. Josephine had organized a few lectures. People of California already were aware of Swamiji because their newspapers also talked of Swamiji's earlier visit to the East and his triumphant lectures. So from the very first day, people started flocking to his lectures. Though there was not much of publicity. There were three sisters from a nearby town who used to come there regularly without missing a single lecture. The Mead sisters. They 
lived in a town nearby called Pasadena. Pasadena is a very beautiful, quaint little town. Today it is world famous. For what? It is the place where you have California Institute of Technology Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That is the place from where the first satellites of the United States were monitored. Even the moon landing was monitored from Pasadena. But at that time Pasadena was a simple town. One day they invited Swamiji to come to their place. Swamiji agreed. <clears throat> One morning in the company of Josephine, he came there in a horse carriage, stayed for half a day. The sisters were not happy. They said, you come and stay with us. Swamiji agreed. <coughs> when all his lecture assignments were over, one day Swamiji with his valise, a bag, came to their home in Pasadena, got down from the horse carriage. One of the three sisters was standing at the door. He told her, you invited me, I have come. Mrs. Vaikov, who later became a Brahmacharini of the Ramakrishna order. Of the three sisters, two became Brahmacharinis. The third became a volunteer worker for the Vedanta Society of Southern California of Hollywood. The room upstairs was allotted to Swami Vivekananda. They looked after him so wonderfully. He stayed with them for about one month or so. During that time his health improved a lot. They arranged for a lot of lectures to be given by Swamiji. It was not only lectures, there was also entertainment. What kind of entertainment? They took him to the nearby places sightseeing places. One day they decided to go to a nearby picnic spot. This is the photo taken in South Pasadena. You can see his face much more relaxed. He looks much healthier. Eco mountain house on top of a hill. Today you can go there by car or by helicopter. It's a beautiful hotel. You can stay there and from there climb up the mountain to the top. From the top, if you look towards the west, you see the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. It's a beautiful place. Swamiji enjoyed his three day stay there, trekking around all the time. There was a footpath to go up, but Swamiji's health did not permit him to walk on foot up to the top, very tiring. So they took what is known as a funicular ropeway. This is a photograph, Vivekananda, second row, fifth from left. Why the photograph? Who took the photograph? Very interesting. You know, these ropeways are risky. Suppose an accident happens, the rope breaks and there are casualties. How do you identify them? If you have the photograph and the list of the passengers, you can identify them. Compulsory. When we went to Lake Tahoe, we had the same experience, the border of Nevada. Before we entered that boat to go on the lake, the four of us, the family, we were asked to stand in one line and our photo was taken. Then we boarded that boat. The waters of Lake Tahoe come straight from the mountains, ice cold, and if you happen to slip into the lake, by the time you come to the surface, you are finished. You are dead. Many accidents had happened. In the boat itself, there was a red line drawn one meter three feet away from the border so that nobody is allowed to go beyond that particular red line. Precautions taken. When we returned from the trip, all the photographs were pasted on a board. We had to identify ourselves. 
as soon as we identified ourselves, that photograph was plucked out. And we were given some additional copies. All of them to be kept on stands, one of them with a magnet so that we can fix it to the refrigerator. Then I realized why this photo was stuck. They had a wonderful time. When they came back to the home of the sisters, Swamiji told them, I have heard that there is a technological institute called Through Polytechnic Institute. I want to visit that. They arranged for his visit. He had a day long visit, came back. He said, I am very impressed. And he wrote a letter to Swami Ramakrishnananda. My dear Shashi, India needs institutions like this. A letter published in the complete works of Swami Vivekananda. <coughs> Normally people don't notice such sentences. But one young man in Allahabad, when he was studying in college, happened to read the complete letters of Swamiji. This caught his attention. He made inquiries and he came to know that this institution called Throop Polytechnic Institute is now California Institute of Technology. 26 January 1950, he became the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru. First thing he did was, he said, I want to realize the dream of Swami Vivekananda. He went to the United Nations. We want assistance from the Western countries to establish institutions in India of the caliber of California Institute of Technology. The United Nations referred it to UNESCO. And UNESCO agreed 10 countries came forward to form a consortium. They appointed one German as their observer who came to India, toured around the whole country and identified a lonely deserted spot 100 kilometers south of Kolkata with only one railway station, nothing else. And that land was taken over by the government of India and in 1952 the first Indian Institute of Technology was established there. You must have heard of the IITs, IIT Khadak. This was followed in 1958 by IIT Bombay. Mind you, Kharagpur was started by UNESCO. IIT Bombay was started by Russia. 1959, IIT Madras was started, where I worked, lived and worked for 34 years. Then, 1960, IIT Kanpur was started by Americans. If the Russians could start an IIT in India, the Americans cannot be far behind. They are always competing with each other. 1962, IIT Delhi was established with British assistance and today I don't know how many IITs there are. Umpteen number of them. Pity is quality is going down. But where was the inspiration from? We want institutions in India of the caliber of California Institute of Technology. In the IIT Act approved by the Parliament, there is a sentence. These institutions shall be modeled on Imperial College of Science and Technology, London, Technische Hochschule Stuttgart and California Institute of Technology, United States. So Swamiji's dream came true. And my proud privileges, I was associated with both the institutions for whom he gave the inspiration, the Institute of Science and the IIT system. From there, Swamiji returned to Los Angeles. Invitations had been waiting for him from the north, San Francisco. So with the permission of S.K. Blodgett, Mrs. S.K. Blodgett, he and Josephine decided to go to the north. Meanwhile, these three meat sisters had contacted Swamiji and asked him, what can we do for your activities? 
he explained to them, I want to start a Vedanta society in Los Angeles, a Vedanta society in, in San Francisco, can you help me out? They readily agreed. One of them, Mrs. Wyckoff, even accompanied him up to San Francisco to help him out. It is a marvelous city, isn't it? Look at the roads. You remember that road, what is it called? Serpentine, Serpentine Road. There is none? Crooked Street. Crooked Street. Our son in law, Murudi, drove a car along that. Then I told him, okay, you deserve the driving license. <laughs> It's very crooked but beautiful. And there are people living there. Houses, people living there. But even otherwise, the streets of San Francisco give you a scare. Yeah. Going up and down, up and down. So Swamiji came there. Where did he stay? For some time he stayed in this building called Red Men's Building, San Francisco. Third building from the right. He changed his residence, home of service and all kinds of places. Again, Josephine organized lectures for him and Mrs. Wyckoff helped her in the organization. In the nearby town of Oakland, there lived a husband and wife team. Edith Allen and her husband, Tom. Edith Allen was later renamed by Swamiji as Viraja Devi. She joined the Ramakrishna order. Thomas Allen became the first president of the Vedanta Society of San Francisco. Thomas Allen had so much regard for Swamiji, he considered him almost as God himself. That was the high respect in which they held him. They were not the only people. Many other people came forward. And it was while he was in San Francisco that the whole group of San Francisco went on a picnic excursion to a nearby picnic spot, Camp Taylor. And it was in Camp Taylor a very interesting incident happened. There was a hotel from the hotel, if you come out, there is a small bridge with a small rivulet. You cross the bridge, you come to the open camping ground where they lived for 15 days. Only some very old people in the group used to live in the hotel. One day, Swamiji had gone to the hotel to meet some of them, was coming back when he saw a few young boys on the bridge with toy pistols. What were they trying to do? They had thrown some balls, rubber balls, into the water. And the rubber balls were not floating away, bobbing up and down, up and down, up and down. They were trying to shoot it. Not easy, you know, when a ball, when the target is in the movement, not easy to focus. Swamiji said, can I have a hand? Can I try it? They laughed. Swamiji picked, took a toy gun from them and one after the other he shot all the rubber balls. They asked him, how do you do that? Have you handled this gun before? No, first time in my life. Then how do you do it? Concentration. I concentrate on the movement and then I aim it in such a manner that it goes and hits the ball directly. Taking into account the up and down motion. It requires enormous concentration. The people in the camp are amazed to see that. Then they understood. Swamiji practices what he is preaching also. <laughs> so after the whole lot was over, they came back to San Francisco and now Swamiji decided, I have to go back to Los Angeles and from there I have to return to India in gradual stages. So he came back to Los Angeles took the permission of Mrs. Blodgett and all the other friends he had made. And meanwhile, Josephine had gone back to Ridgely Manor and Swamiji, now alone, started his journey back to New York. On the way, he stopped over in Chicago. 
paid a last visit to the Hale family, stayed for three days. On the last night before his departure, there was a dinner, special dinner. He had this special dinner. At the end of dinner, he got up from the table and told the Hale family, excuse me. Mrs. Hale said, Swamiji, there is ice cream to follow. You know, Swamiji was very fond of ice cream. He said, yes, I know, I'll come back. Ten minutes later, he came back. His eyes were red. He had been weeping. Mary noticed it. She thought it is a very, very sensitive moment. But she didn't make any remark. <coughs> Swamiji himself said, you know, it is so difficult to part. I told you already, he was extremely fond of that family. You remember that incident? Sir, are you a delegate to the Parliament of Religions which changed his life? How could he ever forget that family? And he knew he will never see them again. The family did not know that they will never see him again. But he knew that. So because of that, he wanted to spend some time with them. Next morning, he returned to New York. To his surprise, he found there were about 10 to 12 people waiting for him in New York who said, Swamiji, don't go back to India directly. Let us go to Europe. Do a lot of touring. If possible, let us go to Egypt. See the pyramids also. Then you can leisurely go back to India. Swamiji agreed. Who is to bear all the expenses? Francis Leggett said, I'll bear all the expenses. Emma Calvey said, nothing doing. It is my privilege. I will take care of the whole party. She arranged for first class berths by a ship going to Calais. And one day, all of them left New York port to come to Calais. And from there, they took a train to come to Paris. At that time, there was a conference in Paris of <clears throat> various religions of the world, a mini parliament of religions. This is a photo taken in San Francisco and this is a very important letter. After this, I will close the class. You see the logo on top? You find that on all products of the Sri Ramakrishna order. This was designed by Swamiji. What does that coiled serpent represent? Which yoga? Kundalini. Kundalini, which yoga? Raja. Raja yoga. Sun's rays? What happens when the sun rises in the morning? Light everywhere. Jnana yoga. Knowledge, enlightenment. The flower, lotus flower? Bhakti Yoga, the waves of the lake, action, Karma Yoga. And what is that? Swimming? Swan. What is Swan in Sanskrit? Hamsaha. You know that has now become a mantra. It is called Soham Mantra. Soham Ham Saha. Breathe in. Soham. Breathe out, hum, sa, that is one. And which is the supreme swan? Paramahamsa. He has described it in that letter. This he composed in New York. So we leave the whole group in Paris to attend this Paris exposition and the inter-religious conference and pick them up tomorrow. Okay? Lots of details are available in the books by Marie Louise Burke and Ashim Chaudhary. And about his European travel now, there was a Frenchman who later became a sannyasi, Vidyatmananda. He has written a book, Swami Vivekananda in Europe. He goes into minute details. If you have to read the lit entire literature of Swamiji, it may take about 10 to 15 years for you to complete. So much information has been gathered and is available. 
I am only giving you a sample to excite your curiosity. Even if one of you after this course of lectures decides to study a little more than this, then the courses I have given will be a success. Otherwise, okay, I have to do my duty. Karmanyeva adhikaraste ma phalesha kadachana ma karma phalahetur bhuhu mate sangostva karmani Shri Krishna has already said everything. So we meet tomorrow. Hari hi om tat sat Hari hi om tat sat Shri Rama Krishna arpanamastu Shri Rama Krishna arpanamastu